another round. Game Dunkers, we are having a, a fantastic a fantastic time through our various multimedia exercises. And we are joined by a couple of wonderful folks with Mustache Game to make the gods weep. Um, <laughs> that's actually meant as a positive. I don't know if it came across that way, but here we are. Uh, no, look, we have coming in from us uh, as the brave representatives of Amble Studio. Who are like a, an artist, like a, a collection of artists and facilitators and gamers who have been basically working to bring TTRPGs, like and the ideas behind them, out of the basement and into the wider world in some really interesting and creative ways. Um, so look, you're yeah, rolling out here, Jason Logan. Thanks for coming out. How are we doing today, gang? <laughs> yeah, pretty good. good. Pretty good. Pretty good, pretty pretty good to be mate. here. Thanks for having us. Now, nah, look, awesome, awesome to have you here. Now. You've, uh, you've 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 rolled in with the with the the like the the title taking games to work. Now I I have seen the uh, Jay's rock around occasionally with the big horned helmet in what could uh, like charitably be, consi be considered a workplace. So I'm not sure if that's exactly what we're talking about here. But no, look, I, I I I'm very keen to see what you got in the presentation here, gang. And I might just let let you let you get kicked off because you'll always explain this way better than I ever did. So <laughs> if you're good to go, I'll flip the switch and uh, I'll let you get to it. Cool, mate. Thanks, Thank buddy. You. All right, take it away, Jace. You want to start? Yeah. Well, hi team. Um, so as uh, Paddy introduced us. Um, my name's Jason, part of Amble Studio. Um, I'll let Logan introduce himself. Uh, yeah, Logan, uh, he and Pronouns, also part of Amble Studio. Cool. And sort of we're part of the um, Amble uh, Studio. Um, and as Patty sort of mentioned in the outro, Amble Studio is sort of focused on um, a couple of different things. We're a community-focused organisation, um, probably pointed most of the time at improving how people enable positive change through the um, power or the engine of games. Uh, and that's the sort of stuff that we've been uh, focused on for the last two years now. We sort of recently turned two. Um, and, you know, there's sort of three ways that we kind of do that. We uh, make games, thanks to uh, some very, very skillful folks like Logan, <laughs> who are part of the Amble Collective. Um, we help other uh, folks uh, make and deploy games for whatever it is that they're, you know, trying to do. And um, we talk about games a bunch. Um, and the idea of that is to, you know, increase literacy and market by um, raising awareness of, you know, sort of our, our approach to fun games. Um, Logan, is there anything that I missed there? Yeah, yeah just, I guess, going deeper on, on getting people to work together through games. It's, you know, it's really about collaboration and good change happens when people work together. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, the idea of people being greater in the sum of their parts in, in coming together, we can really create big change, um, in ways that we couldn't alone. Thanks mate. Yeah. And that's probably, it's a, it's a really good segue. I don't know if we could, um, uh, switch to slide three. It's like, we've got a, you know, I mean, why, why are we bothered doing this kind of thing? Um, we do have a theory of change, like a lot of um, community orgs or a lot of folks who are um, focused on um, some kind of change or seeing different stuff happen, um, you know, it, often you're driven by a theory of change. And our theory of change revolves around um, what Logan was saying, the idea that in increasingly complex environments and in increasingly complex social contexts and in increasingly complex um, market environments, organisational environments, um, political environments, generally these sorts of um, the challenges that are faced by folks involve um, multiple perspectives and multiple parts. And the challenge in um, intervening in these spaces or making good change stick in these spaces is how you bring those multiple parts together effectively and get them working together. So it's um, hence collaboration. Um, just by thumbs, do, can you see the um, this slide three there? Looks good to me. I can see it on on okay, Twitch. Cool. No worries. Yeah, I I, I can't. My my system's running a bit slowly, so uh, apologies. Um, uh, but you know that slide there just represents an agricultural system, and I mean it's just meant to um, demonstrate how there are multiple components to something. So something like a you know a food system, there's a whole bunch of different um, frames and layers that you've got to think of. 
Um, and, you know, if you're trying to um, engender change in these sorts of spaces, you need all of those parts to play together particularly well. Um, yeah. Logan, what do you, any, anything to add to that? I just oh, picked the brain for that question. Sounds great. I think you covered it pretty you well. Know, so, so essentially, you know, th and this is what Logan was saying, you know, the, the focus of, of what we've been deploying Game 4 is for um, enabling change. The basis to enable change is collaboration. Um, and collaboration, if we skip to, I mean, you don't have to take our word for it being kind of important. If you have a look at slide four, this is the, you know, the Australian Government Industry Priority Skills um, website. And uh, I think it's number five there. Collaboration skills are kind of um, seen as um, increasingly important uh, going forward. Their description of it, which is slide five, I don't know if we want to flick to that, is a little bit insipid. Um, but it is, the, it is the received kind of notion of collaboration. So, you know, um, collaboration as interpersonal skills, which are highly sought after, and the ability, ability to collaborate and share information um, really, really helps organisations adapt to change and, you know, um, improves outcomes, um, enables people, they said there at the end, effectively respond to customer needs. Um, but, we, you know, we literally um, try and take that sort of stuff on board and um, deploy the ideas that, well, what we understand about the games environment into this kind of space. Um, and the crux of that is, you know, sort of slide six there, which is um, essentially we need more parties. When it comes to collaborating, this is stuff that gamers do all the time, you know, especially the, I mean, we're talking to the TTRPG community here, um, you know, the, the idea of bringing people together around a shared narrative to achieve a common goal, um, to create something that's more than the sum of their parts, to, um, you know, really harness the skills and um, diversity that's within the group. All of these sorts of things are things that um, gamers, in particular, TTRPG gamers, um, do all the time. Um, now that's not, maybe not rocket science, you know, like back in 2010, McGonagall, um, Jane McGonagall was famous for her TED talk saying that, you know, gamers were going to be responsible for the epic win. She was specifically talking about um, uh, MMA, um, massively multiplayer online um, games, but you know, that observation that it's actually the sorts of skills that bring people together from diverse backgrounds to work together for a common goal is exactly what we need to be doing. Um, you know, and in the academic community, sort of a, a lot of the sort of the theory that informs our, or the research work that informs our thinking, um, there's mobs like the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence that suggest that collective intelligence or the um, ability of a group to perform better than the sum of its parts requires um, consistently three things. Now that this is consistently three things across heaps of domains, business, um, music, sporting teams, uh, military operations, um, you know, whatever you, you, you can imagine, but it's diversity, requisite diversity, high, high diversity, a really good understanding of one another, which they cryptically call understanding the mind of others, <laughs> but essentially high empathy and EQ amongst the group, and then e the ability to have equal information sharing and turn taking. And the bit that, you know, we've um, said there is that these are all traits that, you know, we use all the time as gamers, um, but specifically for this mob, you know, like the, what we're talking about today, these are things that we're often explicitly thinking about as game designers. Um, and, you know, it's probably the design element that we might want to get to the back of the room next. Yeah, so yeah, if we go on to slide seven, um, as as Jace was sharing, we are, we're talking about there's a there's a huge overlap between games and uh, this is ways of working, not uh, World of Warcraft. Um, <laughs> that's another way that that game that games and work overlap. It is very specific. Um, not anagram. What's it, uh, whatever that thing is. Acronym. Um, acronym. Thank you. Yes, the W O W is an acronym that that is shared as well. Uh, but yeah, slide eight. If we're looking at uh, games. There are a lot of, you know, things that we're talking about that exist in the games world specifically. Slide nine shows kind of what is more in the ways of working world. And then slide 10, there's a huge overlap there um, where these two worlds cross, you know, from coming together to create an aligned understanding, having coordinated action, whether that's, you know, carrying out a, a business plan or, you know, a plan to, you know, go through a maze or a dungeon or infiltrate a castle. Uh, there's a shared narrative, there's improvisation and innovation, and there's collaboration, as we were talking about before, which is very key um, to games and to ways of work. So if we go to slide 11, 
uh, we can see that overlap. But but crucially, in slide twelve, we're just we're just throwing Lee under the bus here, just making them switch slides at, at superhuman speeds. But at slide twelve here, I want to pull out as Jace was kind of hinting at before. Uh, with design, that we're not just thinking about this as players of tabletop role-playing games, but also as designers of role-playing games, um, and having that design mouse um, can can really be beneficial for games, and therefore also uh, in the world of work. Did you want to talk more about that, Jace? Sure, mate. I mean, the thing that um, really differentiates something um, intentionally from something... Well, when, when people talk about design, design is about making... Um, key choices intentionally about what you bring into something and what you leave out of something and um, that really highly defined skill so people are familiar with that kind of choice in things like visual design or graphic design what's the color palette that I use how big should my sizing be what's the arrangement of things um, when we talk about game design you know yeah we think about things mechanically you know what rule set should I be applying here what do my um, players need to know here what sort of information is right to present here what's the right spread of skills or characters that I need to bring in here but all of those things are really very very subtle decisions that um, designers game designers make intentionally for the benefit or for the outcome of the, um, the, the play and in service of the players and in many ways, it's this exactly the same sets of decisions that um, are made in terms of enabling folks, like that sit in all of those capabilities that we saw above. You know, how do you engender aligned understanding? Well, we make decisions about how to enable that. How do we help coordinate actions? We make decisions about the frames of play that people play in to coordinate that action. How do we create a shared narrative? Well, we put boundary conditions around that kind of thing. Um, how do we enable I improvisation and innovation? Well, we create a safe context for folks um, and we provide them prompts or scaffolding to kind of engender that sort of thing. These are all design decisions that gamers make, um, all the game designers make all the time. And you have an exceptionally developed language and set of skills around that that are uh, enormously valuable. So there's the sort of things that we've, you know, like we've taken this intuition and we've tried to apply it um, in market. So if, you go to, if we go to slide 13, um, some of the ways we've tried to do this at Amble Studio, um, there's sort of three main ways um, that we've done it so far, like that we've experimented in market. And again, you know, we're, we're acknowledging that this is um, a very new domain. Actually, it's probably a good time to talk about the difference between what we're trying to do, like with the people enablement and gamification. I mean, Logan, do you want to speak a bit about that? I think it's important to... Yeah, we can, we can touch on that. So gamification is... Um has been around for a number of years now. It's gotten, gotten to be a pretty hot topic uh, in some spheres. And gamification often uh, revolves around points, badges, and leaderboards, or PBLs, and it's often about uh, encouraging or motivating uh, employees to do actions that they don't really want to do, like you know, make 100 phone calls in a day or that kind of thing, um, by rewarding them with uh, you know points and badges and putting them on a leaderboard, which often, um, you know, sort of fake currencies or maybe you get a bonus if at, you're at the top of the leaderboard at the end. Um, and there can be, not always, but there, you know, gamification has its place, but there can be an element of, you know, the chocolate coated broccoli, um, putting something nice, you know, a sweet wrapper around something that people don't actually really want to be doing. And um, yeah, you know, that, that has its place. But yeah, it is separate from what we're trying to explore and do with game pool design which is around, um, yeah, sort of a more ground up approach of looking at the activity um, holistically and how we can encourage uh, and engage people through, you know, play and games and creating and using a lot of tabletop tools um, to create uh, an experience that people want to be part of. Nice. Thanks, Logan. Yeah, that is a, a differentiation. You know, we're not necessarily, you know, focused on um, the carrot or the stick. It's um, more about, you know, what, what is it that enables people to um, enjoy games? And again, major differentiator in um, genuine game designers. Um, you know, lots of folks, you know, e economists are very good at um, providing, um, uh, you know, uh, intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. You know, it's, it, it, most people can set up a, a, a points or a reward sort of scheme. Game designers, however, have a whole suite of tools that um, they've been using consistently over time to make things fun for folks, to make things engaging for folks, and really um, bring that kind of um, engagement into play. 
So some of the ways we've been trying to do this sort of stuff is um, supporting programs. Um, the example is the most recent example that we've been working with long-time client um, enabling uh, job seekers um, to develop their um, soft skills, so-called soft skills or interview skills or conversation skills um, through um, an implementation of our game uh, sort of platform Green Hollow. I don't know, Logan, do you want to unpack a little bit more of that, like what Green Hollow is or... Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it's a, as, as per the, the client's request, it's a game around building soft skills and it is creating, you know, a game is a, a fictional place where we can do things that we might not otherwise, you know, take some, take some risks, um, you know, you jump off a building and hope that you roll high kind of thing, whereas you wouldn't do that in real life. So following the idea that in a, in a fictional space, in a game, um, the job seekers can try new things, try asking for help or try um, different ways of being in a workplace that they hadn't before. And yeah, try those things on and see how they fit and build those skills for going out and seeking a job. Yeah, and, and it uses all the, the game design kind of scaffolding to, to create a safe environment for job seekers to do that for, for these kids. It's specifically been designed also for um, uh, youth, mental health, long, a long-term unemployed cohort. So those sort of that's the, the the kind of scaffolded or safe safe environment to kind of pursue this um, uh, this development was something that was really important to those folks. So things like turn taking, things like having prompts on cards to you know have a start of a ten rather than a blank canvas, to um, having regular pauses and feedback. We have an inbuilt um, you know say um, X card for instance, etc. Um, there's a bunch of stuff you know that um, is has really enabled um, you know uh, us in that space to help. This organisation deliver outcomes for the client. The second one's with traditional consulting. Um, recently worked with a mob who focuses on bringing play to the workplace. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is about taking a traditional program of work. It might be an educational program, or a um, a um, some kind of uh, informational piece, and putting a bunch of gameful sort of tools around it to increase engagement. Um, mm. And it's really interesting because there are like. As, as this example Jace just gave, like playful kind of minded facilitators out there and they're willing to, you know, go out and, and bring these things to work. But the, the key thing is that, yeah, they, they came to us to de design something. So there are, you know, sort of like in, in the real world, there's lots of players, fewer GMs. Um, there are lots of, you know, players out in the work who are, who are interested in play, but there's fewer designers um, who are who are able, willing and able and excited to create and design these kinds of tools and games. So, yeah, this skill set that that folks here have got is is uh, yeah rare and and exciting. Hundred percent. And then the the third kind of place we've tried to apply some of this sort of design is supporting teams and practitioners themselves. And um, the example up there, uh, Logan, do you want to talk to to that example? Yeah, this was really exciting. So we ran, uh, we run workshops and there was one facilitator who came along um, to our game design for facilitators workshop where we share a lot of tools that we believe are handy for facilitators to bring games and gameful design into their practice. Uh, and she went away, she started designing a game, but she also came back later with this um, five types of feedback to sharpen your scenarios. And as you can see, that's kind of uh, circled there. She's got lines and veils, and which she heard from us, which is a, a tabletop, um, something that's, that's been popular in the tabletop sphere as a safety tool. And so, um, yeah, she's taken safety tools and brought them into her regular work practice and yeah, shared it on LinkedIn and Twitter and that sort of thing and generated some conversations. So um, even small things like, you know, one specific safety tool can have a big impact in, in work. Um, just, I mean, I'm conscious that we've been chatting for ages and it'd be yeah, really in interesting to en yeah, engage the um, actual designers, you know, with y your sort of observation, et cetera, y your observations, et cetera. But we'll just finish off. If we go to 14, there's sort of also a deeper layer that you can apply this kind of um, the game design skills to. And we've been, I guess, um, walking the talk. And from the ground up when we built Amble two years ago, um, we've brought a lot of these uh, gameful design tools into our own internal practices. So these are, um, you know, tools that we use, um, you know, to actually run um, Amble. These are sort of gameful tools that we actually use to, to steer and um, shape our organisation, be it, you know, in strategy kind of spaces, be it for 
feedback, be it for ongoing organisational learning. Um, like I, I'll pass to you, mate. You, you're better at talking about this sort of stuff than I am. So. <laughs> oh, sure. Thanks, Chase. Uh, yeah, so we've got three, um, uh, what are they called? Examples here. Wow, mind blank. I've got the night sky constellation and twinges, which are three parts of our, our culture and strategy, as Jace was saying. So we've got night sky, which, you know, each of them are, are designed as, you know, as a team, but a lot of us being gamers are pulling from games and game tools um, to create these, um, these examples. So night sky um, is, some, is a tool for us to uh, reflect monthly on what we've been doing as Amble. And when I was designing that, when I was part of designing that, I, I drew on Powered by the Apocalypse and moves and what things do we want to constantly be doing. You know, if Amble was a character, if we had a playbook, what moves would we want to have to encourage us to keep doing them? Uh, and then Constellations, Amble Constellations, uh, it sort of twigged my mind like a world-building game, like building out. Uh, it's our, our yearly, our annual reflection process, so it's a bit of a bigger scale and therefore kind of reflects more a world-building kind of game. You can see yeah, various stars and things all connected together like a map. Um, so pulling from world-building games there. And then finally, Twinges, which is, is our version of a sort of a safety tool, uh, which, yeah, very simply is anytime we feel uh, uncomfortable, we just raise that we have a twinge, uh, you know, similar to a pause card or an X card, but it's a piece of language that works well for us and, and as we've used it over time has gained, you know, layers of, of meaning. So it's a particular safety tool, again, sort of pulling from tabletop. So, yeah, perhaps uh, unexpected ways that, that games have been very useful in culture building in a company. Cool. Thanks, Logan. Um, you know, and again, this is sort of just to, to reinforce the, the, our, our intention of, you know, like just to differentiate, this is, again, not traditional gamification. You know, this is taking um, game design principles and um, gameful design principles and putting them into um, and seeing where they cross over in different domains. You know, like if you think about the three games that um, we just shared then with Night Sky, Constellations and Twinges, I mean, they're, they're more on the, not surprising, Logan Timmons is here, but like, you know, on the lyric, lyric game or the gameful rituals kind of style um, of approach. And again, this is probably why um, we're really interested in exploring this sort of domain with the folks who are in this kind of discord and conversation, you know, the TP RPGs of the world, um, especially the indie TP RPGs of the world, because, you know, these sorts of things are being explored um, by folks all the time in, in this space. And the sorts of tools and the ways you approach these ideas are really unique um, and are enormously valuable in domains that sit outside of um, strictly just games or self-discovery, you know, or, or oriented in group play. All right, so how do these sorts of skills um, show up in the wild? We just wanted to say, you know, like, we're certainly not alone in this kind of space, like in the facilitation kind of environment or the people enablement environment or the broader change environment. There's a whole swipe of ways now, like the ways of working kind of space that um, people are using skills like this and where these sorts of skills are, are valuable. And again, to Logan's point, there's a lot of folks doing, i.e. playing in this sort of space now or more and more folks playing in this space now, but there's very few folks who are actually designing in this space um, and that's something that's sort of worth unpacking but you know you can do people convening um you know just in the agile to slide 15 sorry just, just oh sorry yeah yeah, slide 15. yeah how does this how, how does this show up in the wild so you know you can be a people convener and do everything from you know um group facilitation all the way through to you know strategy alignment conflict resolution all those sorts of things um, in the more business sort of space, you know, the Agile community actually uses a whole bunch of, you know, game uh, sort of tools and rituals that they use all the time to help people work more effectively together. Um, but there's, you know, not heaps of folks designing new stuff all the time. You know, they're often really well hashed sort of ideas. Um, and then there's large group facilitation work, you know, where you've, you know, got 50 to hundreds of folks and, you know, you're trying to sort of convene them. Uh, it's more like the uh, massively multiplayer online kind of stuff. But again, in that sort of space, there's a whole bunch of ways that we can be building our design skills to help folks do that more effectively for culture. Um, there's a couple of, you know, uh, links at the bottom of that slide there that we're happy to share afterwards. You know, if you're interested in groups who do this kind of thing and get more of a feel for how this sort of stuff shows up in the wild. Um, but that's it for us. Logan, unless I've missed anything, like I think we've no. probably yacked on for long enough. Like we sort of think you're right. um, shared things. But, you know, they, um, just the injunction like w what we really came to say is, you know, keep playing, um, 
and keep designing. But importantly, you know, put that on your LinkedIn. Um, game design is actually really, really crucial. We, we, I mean, mm. we're yet to completely prove it out in market or any of that sort of stuff. You know, we're busy exploring it and hopefully we could, but we have this massive intuition that, you know, um, as game designers, you're actually on the cutting edge and you've got really valuable, exciting skills that um, genuinely make a difference um, in these kinds of spaces. Yeah, and yeah, slide sixteen to see us out. But yeah, these these kinds of you know, it's experience design. It's bringing people together. It's improvising. It's adapting. You know, there are certain ways that you can talk about this kind of stuff on your you know your resume, your LinkedIn, what have you, um, to bring to the fore. Yeah, really valuable skills that game gamers and game designers have. Legendary stuff, folks. Thanks for coming out with that. <laughs> no, that's yeah, very happy. Uh, look. Yeah, it's just such a wild new field. And look, uh, I think particularly given the team involved and, and previous histories, I sh we shouldn't be surprised that you've just taken an idea and kind of blown the doors off the boundaries of it. Just like bringing this out into the wider world in such a dramatic way, which I think is really impressive. Um, I did have a couple of questions sort of riding in. And once again, if the folks in the chat, if you've got anything to ask these lovely folks, like jump in and, and get that on the go. Although, to be entirely self-indulgent, I have just mentioned that chocolate-covered broccoli is going to be the name of my new ska band. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, uh, you know, like, it's, it's going to happen. I'm making it real. Um, as, a, as a slightly roundabout question, and look, this is, this is something that sort of came to me uh, when you were talking about, I guess, the uses and the value of these games. And it, many, many years ago, and, and an old judo teacher of mine said, like, people don't know how to fall down. And like that sort of stuck with me. And it's like, when you think about it, yeah, people fall down all the time. That's not a, that's not a hard thing. But if you actually have to simulate yourself falling to the ground, people don't know how to do that. And I think you've come onto something that's similar in communication and you found a gap where a great many people in the, wi in the wider world, I guess, have never really learned a lot of communication skills. What sort of reactions have you had from folks one, when, once they engage and when they realize you're teaching them how to communicate. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I'm thinking about, um, yeah, we're, when we've run playtests and things and, and gotten some, some folks interested. Um, I think something that stood out is around the turn taking. Like we're not really, you know, told or taught how to, you know, we're told, oh, yeah, make sure everyone's heard. And, um, you know, don't speak over everyone, but I feel like at least I never really learned how to do that in a way that kind of felt like that it was actually inviting everybody in. And so there's something around the, the turn taking that people are like, oh, you know, this is how we can bring everyone's voices in. And there's something around explicitly calling everyone in and allowing people to like pass if they don't want to, but still, they still have their turn as, you know, we go around the circle. Um, I think that's sort of stuck out for me. Yeah. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I'm I'm with you, Logan. Like that's something that games do, you know. Like especially TTRPGs do it, it, it particularly well. And you know, the thing from the environment is, you know, the thing that supports is as as we mentioned, you know, the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence shows that teams that have high diversity and share information equally um, are those that perform particularly well. But we're very, um, you know, often you'll hear in, you know, organizational environment or in the classroom, everyone should take their turn. You know, it's important that we have diversity, but in actually in the, the actual tools or scaffolding that needs to sit around to support that is not always um, made explicit. And gamers do it all the time. Um, you know, prompts like, here's your set of moves that you can choose from, or you can improvise yourselves, or, you know, like the, the turn taking, the structured turn taking environment, or, um, you know, these are all, very, very carefully designed tools to enable people to engage equally and effectively. Um, mm. Mm. So yeah, there has been some surprise from some people being like, oh, you know, I enjoyed that in a way that I wasn't expecting um, or people being able to see their fingerprints on the story more than they were expecting. So yeah, there has been, there has been some surprise, but you know, joyful kind of surprise most mm. I was gonna say, I think you touched on something really elegant there too, is, is that like, I think, a lot of people associate this kind of like um, story gaming with childhood. It's, and I think it is a real loss if it's sort of left there. Um, because yeah, like it, 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 and you've shown it does have phenomenal value for, for adults who are looking to communicate more effectively. 
Um, now, I've got another question in from the chat. Now, it's noted this is maybe not easy to answer, but um, you've mentioned the difference between your way of designing and, game, and like gamification as it's sort of popularly understood. Uh, are there ways that you design to counter the more exploitative or less people-focused ways of using games in the workplace? Yeah, I... Oh, sorry, you go ahead, Jason. I'll jump I was in. just going to say, yeah, like... And I don't mean to... We don't mean to unfairly malign um, gamification. Look, to be fair, there's a reason that... And, you know, the fact that it's um, popular in market and all those sorts of things, I think there's there's something to be said that at least it's increasing awareness of, you know, the fact that uh, oftentimes what we're doing as an ontology, like in the workplace, are playing a series of games. When I say games, I mean that in the ontological sense, like, you know, James Cass, Finite and Infinite Games, or... Um, T. Win, you know, who talks about you play anything. Like any any social discourse that we engage in has rules, explicit and uh, non-explicit. What the gamifications folks have done, have said, okay, well, why don't we take the idea that there's these sorts of um, moods that we're trying to encourage and incentivize them, you know, like get people to engage with them more. Um, you know, the, the challenge with that is you, you, you it kind of leads to a, you want to be a... Um, you want to be sure you're a uh, benevolent dictator and you're incentivizing stuff that is actually worthwhile. Like, you know, I, I understand that gamification is really good for getting me to buy another pair of jeans or making sure that I come back to the checkout or, you know, getting me to log on to MTG Arena again so I get my, my gold quotient for the next day. But there's probably other things that we could be doing um, with, you know, um, human play and that doesn't involve necessarily that instrumental kind of lever pulling aspect of things um and as logan said I'm, I'll, I'll let logan talk about that but yeah what a lot of what we focus on is the engagement kind of piece and what is um attractive um to folks you know what 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 are the things that people do and how can we help um that is that is rewarding to them and how can we help amplify that Seems, sounds a bit cryptic but uh, logan uh, you, <laughs> maybe you'll be able to articulate it better it's um yeah, no, no, you, um, yeah, you've got a good piece there, Jace, around the, yeah, incentivization. I think something in gameful design is, you know, to use a, maybe another cryptic kind of saying is focusing on the journey rather than the outcome um, and focusing on, yeah, what are people's experience of looking for a job, for example, or their previous experience of, of having a job. Um, and rather than, you know, ticking off like, oh, yes, you've done the interview module, you know, you know what your greatest weakness is and can answer that question. It's more about exploring the experience and the, you know, the story arc, if you like, um, of the, you know, the, the experience that we're wanting them to have positively in the workplace, um, going through that in a fictional way and focusing on the journey and how they feel about that. And then reflecting on it, reflecting and debrief is a, is a key part. Um, and so there's a lot more about kind of self-learning uh, rather than task completion, I feel. Nice. Yeah. I think that's a, this is a really important insight too because like, like particularly focusing on that discovery element, I suppose, and that engagement element, it does, you know, like we, we, I suppose if something's task-focused, you can tune out, whereas this time if you're engaging with it and creating yourself, the creating, it, creating it yourself, it becomes, does it, do you feel it gives a sense of ownership there? or mm. 100%. Yeah, mm. sense of ownership and yeah, like I said, having having your fingerprints on the thing is mm. yeah, huge. It's a great way to engage folks. Yeah, so and I suppose there we go. Uh one more thing I will sort of wander into. There we go. Um I don't know if that's a really question really a question, but yeah, like uh in, in a world where many use games to escape work and office Space based TTRPG could be cathartic. Okay, yeah. And look, I think coming back to the debrief idea as well, it, it does give a value to a lot of a lot of those experiences and just um yeah, like giving like being able to sort of note that and, and contextualize it. Cause yeah, I, I found um Night Sky in particular is a very impressive exercise for that, just the capacity to look back and I guess categorize your week a little. One other thing that we've sort of like nudged up against here, uh, and I think this is perhaps relevant to Game Dunk in particular, because we found our genesis in this wave of people moving online during the lockdowns. Um, one, thing I, one thing that you two do very well is the sort of hand signaling for when you want to like um, respond but not interrupt. Do you have some favorite hand signals that you'd like to share with the audience and what they mean when you're, when you're, when you're streaming? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, we have, there's some that are sort of cultural and some that, so there's like this, which is, um, what do you, do we, is there a name? It's, it's not jazz hands. It's like twinkle fingers. I don't know. Does it have a name, Jay? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that it has a name. It's just like, yes, I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I just love that, yeah, that there has developed this sort of culture and language of signals here, which I think is really special. We're also really blessed in that um, Logan is a, um, you know, a, a, an Auslan practitioner, so we, mm. we've we've taken a lot um you know part of part of our practice actually is to to try and incorporate as much auslan as we can and so we often use thank you or i understand mm. or um th- those sorts of things so mm. yeah still still learning auslan so yeah mm. so you know as as with any language it takes time yes and it's yeah, a great way to mm. communicate online to fill in the gaps where you know in real life conversation you'd go mm-hmm, or yeah Whereas if you try to say that on Zoom, it's often like, oh, were you going to say something? Oh, no, I was just agreeing with you. Oh, okay. And then, you know, can can be a bit jarring. So, yeah, having hand signals like like you called out, Patty, is, um, mm. yeah, it just works well. Yeah, and I think, it, I think it is a really, really valuable sort of element, particularly in the fields of communication, in which we so often find ourselves. Because, like, so much of both gaming and our work lives now, I think, have moved into that online sphere. Yeah. But, no, look, um. Awesome having you here, folks. And yeah, look, once again, Brave New Horizons, really keen to see what's going on uh, in the future of Amble and uh, the sort of like uh, places you're going to take that. Did you, Now, you mentioned that you do have some links sort of posted up, and once again, we will get them into the notes for you. Uh, was there anything you wanted to plug on the way out? Or? Uh, listen to the podcast. We have a podcast. <laughs> you do have a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Aww. We have a podcast. We have like a uh, you know, website. We have an itch page with a couple games up there. More coming on that front. Um, and we have a website and, you know, all the, all the links will be in the Discord. Um, and we'll just chuck a, a block of links at you. <laughs> we'll get that out to the hungry masses. And, uh, thanks, Ben. Thanks for that, folks. Really appreciate Absolutely it. grand to have you here. Yeah, mm-hmm. thanks for having us. Good luck with Game Dunk. Looking forward to seeing the output, actually. Not that it's about the output, Logan. It's about the journey. <laughs> but I am actually excited journey. to see. Oh, I am excited to see what emerges. So. <laughs> both, both ends. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Take care, folks.